that's a super easy way to lose respect for a coach. But as various players were quick to point out, Mullen and his assistants, assistants lost a lot of respect for uh, a lot, a lot of lost a lot of players' respect with something even more egregious. I apologize if I'm stunning over my words or if you keep hearing me like swallow a lot because talking kind of dries up my mouth. So that's that's the reason why you hear me pause to give myself a chance to breathe. Personal decisions. Uh, even worse than many may realize. Perhaps no player felt the nastiness from Hevesy more than TJ McCoy, who had quite the roller coaster ride up and down the depth chart in 2018. After breaking his fibula in 2018, after breaking his fibula, excuse me, he fully expected to set out the spring and rehab in order to get ready for summer practices. This was the advice his parents and doctor had given him, and even former deep, former uh, Florida offensive lineman DJ Humphreys, who McCoy's calls a big brother to him, advised him to set out the spring when McCoy told him what was happening. Um, DJ Humphreys was a former first-round pick who went to the Arizona Cardinals in 2015. Hevesy didn't agree. Hey, you're not really hurt, McCoy recalled him saying. Get your ass over to the locker room and suit up. Though stunned at first, McCoy remembered feeling he had a little extra something to prove with the new staff. Okay, first of all, if he, if he broke his fibula, then quite frankly, he needs to rehab. Specifically prove that he was not afraid to work. So he did. Nobody forced me. I made the call to play because I wanted to show my coaches my toughness and commitment. But that was a mistake. But Doyle did the best he could on one healthy leg. But by his own admission, he wasn't able to practice to the best of his potential. McCoy recalls a film session where there was an interception thrown and he was unable to sprint after the ball on the still healing leg. McCoy turned toward uh, Hevesy, turned toward McCoy and yelled, Why aren't you busting your ass to chasing him? Bruh, McCoy remembers someone muttering in the room. He's playing hurt. Despite playing at less than full strength, McCoy earned a grade for the spring that should have placed them on the second team offensive line heading into summer ball, but no. I come out for summer practice, and I'm at the bottom of the depth chart, even behind the walk-ons, McCoy laughed. So, okay, time to go back to work. Now I'm a little healthier. I worked my way back up to the second team. Then I fast forward to hell week of practice. We start with red zone. We scored on that first team defense, and I'm doing better than the guy I guess I'm competing against. Four different players all confirmed what happened next. McCoy fired out of his stance and neutralized the defender with a devastating block that sent him tumbling backwards, leading to a big play. Well, that was when Mullen wheeled around to face Hevesy and clearly spoke the following words. So are you going to make a change? The response from Hevesy was simple and curt. Nope. That's when I knew. Mullen could have overridden his offensive line coach. Um... But he didn't do it. He stood by him, loyal to a fault. You could have predicted right then. So Mullen knew that McCoy was better than the head, but better than the guy he was playing behind. But for some reason, he didn't. He's the head coach, and he didn't make the decision to say no. Put McCoy over um, whatever guy you had in front of him. I don't know if that was going to move. McCoy from third team to second team or from um, I guess you could say uh, from uh, I guess maybe competing for a 13 spot to a second team spot whatever the case may be but the fact that that right there shows that Dan Mullen quite frankly did not have the gumption to be the 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 head coach to be anybody's head coach because the fact that you know that a player is better than where he's listed on the depth chart and you still don't override that move and and and, and um, you know, make the decision what's best for the team. That right there showed that Dan Mullen was incompetent as a head coach, not just on game day, but the previous days leading up to game day. Unfortunately, TJ McCoy wasn't the only victim of this, and it wasn't just Hevesy. As Florida fans well, um, know all too well, Dan Mullen just had the habit of not uh, playing the best players for the Florida Gators. <laughs> Anthony Richardson, Kyle Trask, James Houston. Damian Pierce, and even Ventral Miller early on in his career are just some of the examples. At various points during their careers at Florida, former players say Mulliver went over to Todd Grafton to inquire about uh, Houston, Miller, and Andrew Chatfield not seeing time with the starting defense. Each time, Grafton brushed them off, and Mullen, apparently not wanting to ruffle any feathers, 
obediently slunk away and didn't broach the subject with the with that player ever again. How can you respect your head coach when you're out there practicing, watching watching him actively not place the best players in his starting lineup? Another player lamented, I mean, really, how is that possible? Hevesy totally deserves blame for what happened to TJ, but Greg Knox did the same shit at running back. Uh, Grantham did the same shit with the entire defense, and Mullen just couldn't be bothered to step in and override their decisions. He'd rather not argue with his friends that he'd hired. And this is why, if you're going to do business, I don't believe in hiring people, hiring loved ones. Because once you hire your loved ones, as in friends or family, those personal feelings tie into your decision making when it should be about business. Running back Damian Pierce was among the more notable victims of this. Multiple players recall a practice in 2019 where Mullen saw him break four tackles before taking on a long run in 11-on-11s. Um, As the next break, Mullen immediately made a beeline for the running backs coach to inquire why wasn't Pierce at the least second on the depth chart behind LaMichael P. Ryan. No player I spoke to could hear the conversation once Mullen arrived at where Knox was standing, but they all confirmed Mullen walked away looking deflated and even a bit unnerved as one player put it. And Houston Texans fans are seeing the benefits of playing, of having Damian Pierce uh, be their starting running back. Uh, you're the head coach, my guy. One of the players on the practice field that day quipped to me over the phone, you set the damn death chart. You can have your assistants, your assistants can have input. You certainly should listen to them when you feel they know more than about you, about their position. But you have veto power. You just never cared to use it. In other words, Dan Mullen had the brains to be the head coach, but he didn't have the balls. But as before, as inexplicable as those decisions were, the real head scratchers were at quarterback where Mullen himself made the call. Players watched Kyle Trask outperform Felipe Franks throughout the 2018 season only to watch Franks hold on to the starting job. Here, players tune change to outright astonishment as they watch Franks continue to start for the Florida Gators on Saturday. People in this fan base don't know the half of it. Next defensive back told me they think they know all. They think they all know Trash should have been starting over free play Franks all, all along based on what they saw in game action. But let me tell you, it was worse than than many re, many may realize. I'll always appreciate Felipe's heart. The kid is as tough as nails, and he battled for the Florida Gators. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Kyle's decision making was so far ahead of Felipe's. He demonstrated this every day on for months on end and Mullen just watched like a fan and actively didn't do anything. I'll put this as bluntly as I can, a defensive player told me. Mullen brought me to Florida and I'll always be grateful for him grateful for that. Um but to answer your question, I have absolutely no idea what the fuck he was doing there. Everybody loved Felipe's heart, but heart doesn't win the business. And this should have been a business decision. Starting Franks over Trask was completely illogical and downright absurd. I mean there was no way to justify that. It wasn't even close, McCoy laughed. I'm cool with Felipe, nothing against him. The battle between him and Trask, it wasn't even close, man. And Florida fans, if you remember 2019, uh, I believe it was week three, week two, or something like that. Florida's on the road to Kentucky. Florida is down 21 to 10 at Kentucky. Um, Felipe Franks gets hurt. Kyle Trask comes into the game, and the offense from was just night and day compared to where it was when Felipe was playing. And Kyle Trask came in there and won the game and obviously had the great season that he had a year later in 2020 where he became fourth on the Heisman Trophy uh, voting list. And it was quite frankly, it was by far the best offense Florida had since the Tim Tebow era. In a way, oh, oh, he's referencing the game that I'm talking about. In a way, fate bailed out Mullen here, trailing 21 to 10 against Kentucky on the road. Gruesome injury forced Franks out of the action and into the game came Tr Kyle Trask. Trask guided Florida back to victory that day and eventually became a Heisman Trophy finalist the, uh, the ensuing season. But Mullen didn't learn his lesson. He wanted Emory Jones to be a star so bad, a former dis defensive lineman recalled with disgust. He never bothered to consider the possibility that next in line for the quarterback one role may have been somebody else. That someone else turned out to be Anthony Richardson, who, despite playing one full season at Florida, went on to be drafted number fourth overall by the Indianapolis Colts. And that kind of thing, when you do that over and over, is just another way to make sure your players don't respect you. Players contend that as time went on, there were even deeper reasons um, to not respect their head coach. And here's the thing. 
Anthony Richardson wasn't that great throwing the ball wise in 2022, but I firmly believe that had he would have had a lot more starting experience underneath his belt, I think he would have looked a lot better um, in 2021 um, than he would have. 2022, excuse me, than he would have. Um, and I and I think uh, Dan Mullen's offense better suited Anthony Richardson's skill set than Napier's did. I don't think Anthony Richardson was a true fit for what Napier liked to do. I think um, now that I see him playing Napier's system, I think um, Anthony Richardson was better in Mullen's system. But I think that's also a reason why Anthony Richardson may probably should have returned to Florida for this season just to get another year under his belt because. Um, as you can see in his preseason action with Indianapolis, he kind of needs some work, which is why I think he should have stayed. Summer of 2020, the Florida Gators culture begins to decay. Individual accounts from Florida players differ. As such, it's impossible to point pinpoint with any true certainty when cracks in the foundation began to show up, as well as the point in which the culture began to implode. But among the six former Gator players I interviewed for the Mullen era piece of this story, it is generally agreed upon that things deteriorated a good bit in the summer of 2020 after players had returned following COVID quarantine. The Black Lives Matter movement swept the nation in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic was not something that Florida coaches seemed to be very interested in. Quarterback coach Brian Johnson and wide receiver coach Billy Gonzalez, Billy Gonzalez, who, by the way, has been rehired back at Florida after previous receiver coach Kiri Colbert left to go coach the Denver Broncos. According to multiple players on that 2020 team, were the only two assistant coaches willing to march in the streets with the players in the wake of George Floyd's death. Dan Mullen was reluctant at first, but after a heart-to-heart -heart with Johnson, Say a few former players, he came to understand the severity of the issue and changed his tone. Soon after most assistants relented and players say for the most part, they were apologetic for their initial hesitance. Grantham, for his part, never seemed to grasp the meaning of it, of course. Because it was so much time with COVID, all he wanted to do was just to get us on the film room and back on the practice field. Another uh, former player recalled and discussed. He saw the whole thing as a waste of time. It wasn't even a political thing, and he's not racist. Make sure you express that clearly. Todd Grantham is not a racist. He just didn't really expect, he didn't really respect any of us, white or black. All we were marching for was to demand that we as black people not be killed. Um, this exact thing is happening everywhere at a terrifying rate. And here's this guy thinking he can have our full attention to install a new look for, uh, install a new look for 11 personnel. Hevesy was the same way, said former players. I don't know if he was as cavalier toward the whole thing as Grantham was, but he was definitely not interested in marching, marching in the streets. Mused the former offensive lineman who's black. He did do it, but I think he saw it as a child would see a death disappointment, like a nuisance. And the first time he did it, he made sure to let us know that. Um, so while many players, uh, players have uh, relationships with Todd Grantham, um, John Hevesy were, uh, were never great. Um, I spoke to every, uh, I asked every player I spoke to for this article if their relationships with Grantham and Hevesy had begun to decline at any point from the summer of 2020 onward. Not a single, uh, one hesitated to say yes. Meanwhile, Mullen made it clear that whatever rifts existed between players and position coaches were not his battles to fight. His favorite things to do were tinkering with the offensive game plan and coaches quarterback. Anything else, including recruiting, was a burden. He wanted no part of interpersonal conflicts between players and their position coaches. It's not unusual for a head coach to let these parties work any issues out, work out any issues themselves. But several players agreed that in this case, his failure to do so um, confirmed what they thought. He just wanted to draw up plays on a whiteboard. He didn't want to be a CEO. He didn't want to make business decisions. He wanted to do things he went his way, and he did what he wanted. Excuse me. At some point, you have to just step in and realize you have to interfere and change the trajectory when things get out of hand. McCoy declared, Mullen never did. I'll give him this, a former defensive player told me. Mullen was a genius calling plays, but there's more to head coach than just that. There are other things you've got to do to ensure your ship is running smoothly. To ensure that your ship is running smoothly. He wrote in instead of is, but he he wrote a massive article, so I kind of forgive him for that. He wasn't interested in those other things, and we could tell that.
pretty clearly. It's just that nobody on the outside could tell that anything was wrong until it was too late. And this is the moment it was too late. December 12, 2020, Marco Wilson throws a shoe. Florida, uh, the senior night in Gainesville was a bittersweet occasion. Florida Gators take the field for the final time with flowers as the PA announcer booms their name through the loudspeakers, hug their players and coaches, and take a final round of pictures with their clean jerseys on beloved home turf. And indeed, this was how the night started. Most fans turned on this game against LSU, feeling confident about Florida's chances to win. Florida sported an 8-1 and record, was ranked 6th in the nation, and LSU had a rash of injuries and opt-outs that resulted in Florida being favored by 24.5. To outsiders, this game was a formality. The Gators were supposed to win, possibly in gigantic fashion, cruising into Atlanta, needing one more win to finally break through and check off the achievement that everyone believed um, Dan Mullen was hired to check off reach the college football playoff, but something didn't feel right from the get-go. A COVID outbreak had pushed this game back from its scheduled slot in October to December 12th. The pandemic had limited the whole, as a whole, and uh, limited the crowd in Gainesville to a quarter of the Swamp's actual seating capacity. Making matters worse, Kyle Pitts was nursing an injury and was mysteriously held out. The game started too strangely as Fuller drove right down the field, got turned away on a fourth down and goal from the LSU one, and it just got weirder from there. Kyle Trask threw uh, two uncharacteristic interceptions, when he, one of which Eli Ricks returned for a touchdown. Um, the other one, and the other one was, was uh, deflected first by Kadarius Tony before being picked off by Jay Ward. But even as they trailed 20 to 7, 27 to 17 late in the third quarter, it still felt as though Florida would battle back, and they did. Trask directed Back-to-back -back touchdown to give Florida a 31 to 27 lead. Excuse me, lead at the end of the third quarter. LSU then retook the lead on a swing pass, and Florida countered uh, with a game-time field goal. Florida's defense banded together and forced a stop, with Florida corner Marco Wilson taking LSU's Cole Taylor. I wonder if he's related to Jason Taylor. Well short of the fir first down line. Ripping off um, Taylor's shoe in the process. Everybody knows what happened to this. Wilson, in his elation, stood up, to, stood up with the shoe in his hand and flung it as far as he possibly could. That triggered um, an obvious 15-yard penalty that set up a game-winning field goal, handing the Gators a stunning loss that all but crushed their college football playoff chances. Derek Ringo, a true freshman at the time, gave me a sad smile as he recalled that fight night. There was a lot going on, Dr. going on there. I won't say that any of us could predict that Marco Wilson could th would throw his shoe, but in hindsight, it did feel like a rubber meets the road moment was coming. And Florida has not been the same since then. Players painted a picture in Gainesville the week before that game as a program on a bye week. The team only held one full pass practice the week of the LSU game, as Mullen was attempting to keep his players healthy for the SEC championship game. Mullen didn't take it seriously, a next player said it was discussed. It was so obvious. That's why Kyle Pitts didn't play. He thought this was just Townsend or Charleston Southern and he could rest his stars. Even some of the play calls in that LSU game made me feel he was just like he was just fucking around in Madden. And you don't do that when you're the head coach of the Florida Gators, especially against another SEC team. But despite the horrifying, lo horrifying loss, the Florida Gators ensuing losses in the NCC Championship game in the Combo Bowl, it still fits as though to the public Florida was in good hands with Mullen and his administration. Mullen's statement of the SEC game being the last time in the 2020 team would play together at the time was ignored, and indeed, the 2021 season started with a 3 and 1 record with the lone blemish victory being a blemish defeat being a 31 to 29 loss to alabama that felt like a moral victory then things fell apart i spoke to players on that 2021 team and it was all too predictable forget franks slash trask slash emory jones debate emory jones or anthony richardson debates when mullen brought back uh Hevesy and grantham he signed his own death warrant and it wasn't a pleasant death uh, okay and then it just talks about um and now it's getting ready to talk about the 2021 season. For as difficult to work with as Grantham and Hevesy were before 2021, players who I spoke with uh, for this piece all agreed that the problem became unquantifiably worse leading up to the leading up to and during the 2021 season. Man, this is a lot of reading. <laughs> uh, 
An offensive player uh, recalled Grantham's increasingly ag- antagonistic attitude towards his players in this final season in Gainesville in an email to me for this piece. He'd walk over to the bench and yell at a player like something like, get your ass ready or wake the fuck up, which was all right, fair enough. Then turn around and walk away and grumble something nasty under his breath. One time it was, what a pussy. Another time it was, little fucking bitch. And that and this was the stuff that I heard. I didn't deal with him directly because he coached the other side of the ball. And we only passed each other so many times. But you can believe that there were more times than, more times that I just didn't hear him. The same player confirmed Hevesy did the same and then offered a disclaimer. Look, he told me. Football players and coaches are no good are no good are no goody two shoes. Coaches cuss players out all the time, but it's meant to motivate, not belittle. My high school coach said all kinds of little stuff I wouldn't repeat, and I still text him once a, at least once a month to see how he's doing or to ask for life advice. It just felt different with heavy C. I won't speak for every single player, but a lot of us simply just didn't like him. We didn't respect him and we didn't trust him. Meanwhile, Hints that Dan Mullen didn't want to be there. There were hints for dropping that Dan Mullen really didn't want to be there. But it only made things worse. In mid-January of 2021, Adam Schefter rep- uh, unleashed a rather strange statement. Dan Mullen in the, in the college ranks is open to going to the pros. There was no credible smoke for Mullen to any NFL head coaching opera openings that cycle, nor were there any reasons to believe that the NFL would want him. Schefter's uh, statement reeked of some sponsored content crafted by someone either in Mullen's camp or Mullen himself as a way to create the first wave of smoke to a rumor that previously had none. Dan Mullen also signed an extension following the 2020 season that increased his pay by a million and a half point. 1.5 million per year. All his assistant coaches, many of whom had contracts set to expire the following uh, 2021 season, watched as Florida actively ensured that their contracts remained untouched. Mullen, already known for being reluctant to hit the road and recruit, now that now had that issue on top of everything else he had to deal with. How was he supposed to recruit his when his assistants precisely had zero long-term um, job security, a fact that uh, some other schools could happily weaponize against them? He wasn't. The player who ignored uh, Grantham ignored in the hallway told me I asked him his uh, rhetorical question. There's an old saying that whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Mullen's comments about the SEC championship game being the last time the team played together, plus his open attitude about not even trying in the Cotton Bowl, were correct because he spoke them into existence. Eh. Various members of that team went on to add that uh, not only were some players uh, privately questioning the leadership within the program, but that there was infighting among the players. Grantham would openly openly treat various players as though they were to some form of, uh, as though they were inferior to some of their teammates, and predictably, resentment grew. When talking to Ringo, I'd already collected so much data from the players that I didn't feel the need that I didn't need to leave with the details. I asked him a neutrally worded question: What went wrong in 2021? And he gave me the exactly the answer I was anticipating. The team wasn't together, and it didn't play together. The culture on that 2021 team became so unbearable that some players dreaded doing the very thing that they were at Florida to do: play football. Multiple players told me that they dreaded getting out of bed for workouts, not because it was so early in the morning, but because they knew that arguments um, with their team awaited them. There were several clicks on that team, and some members of that team saw every moment that they had to collaborate and simply spend time with their teammates as a chore. We were we were just we just weren't playing as a true team. Current offensive tackle, offensive Austin Barber told me, which was so hard to think about because football is a team game, and the hardest part for me, being a true freshman for the scout team, um, was not being able to do anything about it. And at the same time, while Florida's 2021 season got off to a three and one start. Um, behind the scenes, years of being loyal to people who did not do their jobs correctly or adequately uh, were finally catching up to Dan Mullen. His refusal to bench a struggling Felipe Franks until he was forced to in the form of a broken leg, along with his simple refusal to bench Emory Jones for a to bunch of struggling Emory Jones for Anthony Richardson. I'm guessing that's what he meant. Um, were frustrating for fans, but three and a half years into his tenure, he survived them. But that didn't mean players couldn't see Mullen's unraveling take place right before their eyes. And I'm going to take a little break here because I've been 
I've been reading this article for out loud for about 40 minutes, so I need to take a break to um help my uh, voice. So <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> 